Now the topic right now is data sheets. What do we mean by data sheets? You, you can't do a good job for that customer unless you know what the capabilities are of all these things that they've been talking about this morning have been put together into a belt. And now, will it work in your application? Material construction, okay? It gives specific data on the composition of the belt. What do we mean by that? The, the material that, that is used in that belt, okay, and it's gonna consist of both the covers, the fabric, or the carcass, <laughs> and the gauge of that, that particular materi cover material. Then it talks about minimum pulleys. Why is that important? Doug, earlier you said nose bar. I heard you talking about that, that application. You said it has a nose bar. Everybody know what a nose bar is? How many don't know, you know, just don't, don't be a, a nose bar. Used a lot in the baking industry. And I'm not an artist, but bear with me, okay? Okay. Many times, very small. Very small diameter. And it can be a solid nose bar, or it could be a roller. But that nose bar is to give you a close transfer point. That's why they use it. Without having that close transfer point, they wouldn't be able to move the material from one conveyor to the next. So if you, if you look at the nose bar, it, that's critical because you need the flex characteristics in the belt in order to go around that small diameter. Ron, what's the smallest uh, that you have? Smallest nose bar capable? Eighth inch. An eighth inch. An eighth inch. No. Really? Eighth inch radius? Radius. Eighth inch diameter. Diameter. Eighth inch diameter. Diameter. Sixteenth radius. Sixteenth radius. Can you imagine that? You imagine how close you can put those conveyors together if you have two of those nose bars that are like that to transfer. Well, see, so those are the, the, the things that you have to be aware of. And not every belt is going to be able to go around that diameter of a nose bar. Because what would happen if you violate minimum pulley diameter? What happens? Destroy the belt. Separates the covers. Separates the covers. Causes wrinkles in the fabric. Um, what other things can happen to it? Where's the, there you go. What's the weakest point in the belt? Now it's not 100% as strong as, it, you know, I, I used to use a, the term it's about 80% of your strength, a splice. They like to say it's 100%, but I don't, never believed it. 80% maybe. So that's the weakest link that you have in a belt. And so you have to be able to make sure that you've got enough protection there. Okay, so now we've got nose bars, and up here we said nose bars and rollers. Pulley diameters. You got a pulley in here you need to know what that minimum is, okay? Again, it's the same characteristics. Now what happens if you have something coming off the backside of here? This is what we refer to as a back bend, right? And sometimes they can be as much as 180 degree back bend. If you're going into a drop situation, 
or take up, say a center drive, if you will. That would be back bending the belt to that degree. So you take it down and take it back up 180 degrees. So you've really been taking that belt and putting it through extremes. You have to take every aspect of a conveyor system into consideration when you're looking at minimum pulley diameters. Clear? Everybody follow it? Okay. The <coughs> thickness of the belt. The maximum width. We, we talked about this earlier. Ron mentioned it. Maximum belt width. This is dictated not anything that, that you do from a, from a manufacturing standpoint, but what we're talking about is the maximum width that this belt should be employed in a, maybe in a trough uh, situation for load support. That could be a maximum width that's on the data sheet. Maximum width could be just the availability of the belt. But um, you, you need to make sure that a belt is properly supported and um, in, in maximum width and for troughability, there's a maximum width. And there's a minimum as well depending upon any, any trough situations. Typically, we don't worry about that, that much in lightweight. Load factors. This is the one that creates more problems in terms of data sheets, in my view, than, than any of the others. The calculated load a belt will handle before and the stretch you can expect under that load, okay? Do you ever design a, or spec a belt for the minimum? <coughs> Why? And what, what do you use a, as a criteria? Um, there's, there's different industry rule of thumb, and I don't know what the two manufacturers in here would say, but I like to stay below 60% for design. In other words, if you have a calculated tensile requirement of 60 pounds, I would want a minimum of 100 PIW belt in that application. Minimum. 40 to 60. You build in safety factor on safety factor, but it's because of deterioration you'd have from splice standpoint. And what happens with any conveyor, it's elastic. It stretches. It stretches so you have to make sure that you you have the capability of, of having enough take up. And if you are at the maximum design characteristics and you start stretching that belt, it's going to start doing what they call necking down. Necking down is simply the belt will start getting narrower. You've stretched it so far that it, it just has to pull itself together. And that will happen. That's another way to check to see if he's been putting too much tension on a belt. You know, in the real world, a lot of times, the load on lightweight belting isn't normally a lot to worry about. No. The loads, it seems to me, that the belts experience the most that are detrimental are induced by the people running the belts. Just tensioning it. Tensioning it too yeah. much, yeah. There's. The customer will, may ask you, well, how tight should I run this belt? You know, and th they probably have gotten mad at me any number of times when I've said, you only want to run that belt as tight as necessary to keep it from slipping. To pull the load, right? Just to carry the load. Don't 
tension it any more than necessary. We're going to go into tracking and training. There will be other things that we'll talk about in that uh, later on. But uh, don't tension a belt any more than necessary that, to carry a load. And so that, that's, a, that's a key point. On European style belts, it's expressed as 1% of elongation, which is the amount of load per inch of width to elongate the belt, 1% of its length. Okay, 1% of its length. And that's shown in newtons per millimeter. Now I had to get a refresher again this morning because I, I can never remember that number. But a newton is 5.6 pounds. There's a conversion factor. There's, right. a, there's a conversion factor, but it's not 5.6 pounds. If no. you take newtons per millimeter yes. times 5.6, time, time, yeah. that'll give you pounds per inch. Yeah. That'll give you your PIW in, in, in pounds. And there's a NIBA reference sheet for yeah. that, a tech data sheet. So if you have a, a, a 10 newton belt, I wouldn't even... So let's let's just do a not in a not even a ten an eight eight times five point six pounds would be a forty four forty five pound belt okay forty five pounds p i w we talked. We started this morning saying lightweight belts run up to how much? Good, 150. I used to have a guy that used to carry around 50 cent pieces to. to you know, let's pretend. Um, so if you if you keep that in mind as you're working with systems, and you look at the data sheets and you know how to convert that, you're going to get that uh, that right. Now on. American-made belts, we can't do the same thing. So we figured that uh, the amount of elongation to elongate the belt, 2% of the belt length. So you, there is a difference in the way you have to look at the data sheets. Some data sheets will only give you newtons. And the elongations expressed like that, and some data sheets will be in PIW. Go ahead. Yeah, keep in mind when you're looking at spec sheets in particular, um, there will be the European standard numbering system, there will be a US numbering system. Of course, the US numbering system is in inches per width. Mm -hmm. In the European standard, it's newtons per millimeter. Per millimeter. So the way, and the way you see that is in a European number, you will see an eight, a 10, a 12. When we talk about European styles and numbers, we talk about an eight strength or a 10 strength. Right. Uh, when we talk about a US specification, we're talking in terms of 90 pound, 150 pound, right. 120 pound. So there are uh, uh, differences there when you look at those numbers. In the European style, the numbering system, you will see numbers like 8, 10, 12. That's Newtons. One thing, uh, in the States we use ASTM, and there are many different ASTM procedures for testing belting of all types, light duty and heavy duty, and the splices. So when we test splices, for example, or when we test belt, you're expected to get a certain safety factor and the safety factors build into the ultimate breaking strength of the belt versus its working strength, which is what we call the PIW, the mm -hmm. pounds in width working strength. Over and above that, when we consider the splices, whether it be a mechanical or a vulcanized splice, uh, there's at least a minimum requirement of four times safety yeah. factor. Four to one. So, so if we are a 10 time or eight time safety factor with 2% elongation 
and we are at a four times safety factor of uh, a splice strength, whether it's mechanical or vulcanized, you're still uh, in the neighborhood of 40% of the ultimate braking strength right. of that belt. So if you're braking the belt, <laughs> you got a big problem. You're pulling on it way too hard. <laughs> yeah, and you know, you have to look at the cause. The root cause of failure is a key element it's, it's good to be armed with all this information because you need to be a troubleshooter as you're using this information. You know, one of the, the key things is, you know, belts breaking or them people pulling on them too hard is slippage. More often right. than not, the belt's slipping and they want to tighten it up to keep that from happening. When the real remedy for that is more wrap around the pulley right. or more friction on the drive pulley and rather than pulling tighter. You will also Nike. reach a point when you're tensioning a belt and over, over tensioning it, that it'll start slipping more because you will have shaft deflection and it'll actually start slipping more before it breaks the shaft. So pulley lagging is very important. Yeah, yeah, a lag pulley, lags absolutely. Or one of your snub rollers there to get yeah. more wrap around right, the right drive here. pulley. You know, instead of having 180 degrees of wrap, you would have 220 to 240. That if that's the drive pulley. And that allows for less tension. Absolutely. Exactly. Longer belt line. Uh, 180 degrees of wrap will require more tension than 240 or 220. Okay. More influence over the belt, right? More contact right. with the belt. More, more contact, more, more pulley contact because it's, it will grab the pulley better. I mentioned it earlier, every belt is going to stretch. We said that earlier this morning. A belt will stretch over time. I've used the rule of thumb in the field that 80% of your stretch is going to occur in the first 10 hours of operation. Very, very key, 80% of your stretch. So that's a critical time to keep them watching that belt because you're not gonna stay there for 10 hours watching that track in, are you? But it might be who of you to do a callback have you checked on the system? Is it running okay? It could save you another problem customer. First, the, how many hours did you say? First 10 hours. That's a, that's a, a rule of thumb number, okay? You know, we didn't probably say it much, but uh, a lot of most manufacturers heat set their fabrics and there's a couple reasons for heat setting the fabric is to get them to adhere better to the coatings and all that but also it's like the flannel shirt you throw in the dryer and you heat set it and the, the sleeves come up to your elbows now instead of your wrists <laughs> you, you, you know when they heat set these fabrics they pre-shrink them mm -hmm. so that they're more able to carry a load so that they don't stretch as much right so they heat set the fabrics and all that kind of thing to keep that to a minimum when they when they manufacture a belt Okay. Tensile strength. I think we've covered a lot of it. the maximum force or load applied to the belt that can cause it to rupture. Tensile. What did we say? A 120 pound belt would be roughly the ultimate tensile. 120 pound PIW. American, about 1,200. That's a, that's a good number to use. Okay, the tensile strength is the maximum force. Some will break before that, some will break over that. They measure, they measure this type of test in the industry with an Instron tester. That's a machine that you cut a dumbbell out of the belt 
and you put it between these two devices and you pull a one inch wide strip and you pull it to the point of breaking and it'll give you a measurement. So you've had a, you've had a dumbbell shape. <coughs> this is fastened here, this is fastened here and it's just a straight dead pull. And this one inch wide piece will break and it may break within a range. Some may break if you do enough of them, 90 pounds to 1,200 pounds or whatever. But they'll take the, that range and create their graph and determine what the, the breaking strength of that belt is. I think you're still doing that type of testing. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Daily. Did when I started in the industry 42 years ago. So you see how we've moved. Is that an important point we should make, though? I mean, yeah. I mean, we're talking about tensile strength and we're talking about stretch and all that kind of right. stuff in the ratings. 150 pound per inch of width belt doesn't mean that if you put 150 pounds on it, it's going to break. No. It means when you put 150 pounds on it, you can expect it to stretch 2%. Yeah. And then pull the load. Right. There's the difference in, in ratings, tensile strength, breaking strength. 